Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Healthy Moving Podcast, the show that empowers you to exercise less, but move more so you will feel better. I am your healthy moving enthusiast, Jen Hoffman from healthymoving.com. Today, we're talking about self-care. If you aren't taking as good a care of yourself as you should be, you probably think it's because you just don't have the time to. I actually think time is not the issue. I'll tell you what is in today's show. Plus, I'm answering a listener question about scoliosis. Even if you don't have a scoliosis diagnosis, you can learn a lot from my answer to her question. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's going to be a fun one. About 10 years ago, I was sitting in a workshop led by one of my favorite yoga teachers and a dear friend, Judith Hansen Lassiter. She shared a concept from the practice of nonviolent communication that rocked my people-pleasing self to the core. The idea is that you shouldn't do something for someone else that you don't really want to do. She said, there's this idea of something called a duck index. The duck index is that you imagine that pretty much one of the happiest states around is a child feeding ducks. So that's 10 on the duck index, as happy as a kid feeding ducks. One on the index is not happy at all. She said that she doesn't do anything that doesn't make her at least a seven on the duck index. Well, I was shocked because there are many things in life that I do for people that I don't necessarily feel a number seven about, you know, changing diapers or taking out the trash, cleaning up messes, all those kind of things. They just don't put me anywhere near as happy as a kid feeding ducks. So I was thinking, how can she live her life that way? That's pretty selfish. She went on to explain that when you do something for somebody that you don't really want to do, that there's a harm that's caused, kind of like the impact of resentment. I really understood that because I know what that building resentment can be like, but I still was perplexed. Well, how do you do the things you have to do in life and love on your people in the way that you have to if you only do the things that make you at least a seven on the duck index? And then she shared the secret that when someone asks you to do something that you don't naturally feel a seven for, You ask a simple question. Sometimes you might ask it actually to the person or you might ask it in your head. But the statement goes something like this. For example, my husband asks me to go see a movie that I don't really want to see. Instead of saying, okay, and then thinking, but he's going to owe me in my head, which is pretty much my typical default behavior, or instead of just saying no, I could say to him, Hmm, you want to see that movie? It's not really something I want to see. Entice me with your needs. Those are the magic words. Entice me with your needs. Then maybe my husband responds with something like, you know, we haven't had much time together. I'm not really in the mood for like a big, deep conversation, but I just want to see this movie and I'd really like to hang out with you while I see it. Suddenly, something happens inside of me. My natural inborn desire to see the movie that was maybe at like a four or a five on the duck index just begins to rise. If I'm not yet to a seven, I can say, okay, tell me more. I just need some peace and quiet. Can we just sit together and watch this movie? And the more he talks about why it's important to him, the more my natural joy at doing it begins to rise entice me with your needs. Of course, I can't say this to my kids because they don't know, but when I need to do something in a motherly role that isn't necessarily something I naturally feel a seven about, I begin to think about their need, why they need me, the privilege it is that I get to be these amazing people's moms. And naturally, that kind of resentment that I might have felt in the past melts away, and I feel excited about serving them. This same concept, this same paradigm 
applies to how we take care of ourselves. You know, I hear from so many people that they don't make time for self-care, that they aren't either moving their body or eating the way they want to or resting the way they know they should, and they just don't have time to. That's the common excuse. I don't have time to take care of myself. But I don't really think that time is the problem. I think it's that it's not high enough on our duck index. We don't understand deeply and profoundly the body's need for self-care. And we're oftentimes in a place of kind of battle with ourselves. We resent things about our body. We're not happy with certain things. And so we really don't feel like taking care of ourselves. If we did, it would become a priority, just like all the other things in life that we know, hey, this needs to be done. And so we get it done. Self-care isn't happening because we're at war with our body. And the way to end that battle begins with those words, entice me with your needs. When I'm teaching, whether it's that I'm teaching a one-off workshop or when I'm teaching people in my coaching and challenge program, I always equip them with the information about why they're doing what they're doing. This is what a lot of exercise programs miss. They emphasize, this is how you perform the exercise, but they don't really get to the heart of the matter of why you need it. Why is it important? When I share the why behind each and every alignment adjustment that I'm asking people to make or exercise that I'm asking them to fit into their day, I'm helping them to be enticed with their body's needs. Because something happens naturally when you learn what it is that you really need and why. You just instinctually begin to make time and space for that in your life. And how you feel about your body and taking care of it, it moves from, goodness, sometimes a one or a two on the duck index, all the way up to a seven, then maybe an eight. And you're just naturally weaving self-care into the fabric of your life. If your self-care has been lacking, I want to help entice you with your body's needs. I'm teaching a free mini class that will help you kickstart your self-care routine this summer. You can sign up for one of several live sessions at healthymoving.com forward slash free June. That's F-R-E-E-J-U-N-E. Or if it's easier for you to text from wherever you're at right now, you can just text the words free June, no space, to 33444. And if you're ready to really dive in and learn more about your body's need for movement and how to get that movement as you live your life, check out my coaching and challenge program. We're starting our six-week summer challenge on June 28th. So head to healthymoving.com forward slash coaching for all the details and prepare to feel amazing in and about your body. Okay, I'll be back in just a moment with this week's Q&A. Hello. I have a question um, about scoliosis and alignment. Um, As someone with scoliosis, alignment is extra hard for me, and I wonder if there are things I can do to be more aware of how my scoliosis affects my alignment, um, and if alignment is even possible for someone with scoliosis. Um, Just general thoughts and ideas and advice about that would be awesome. Thanks. Bye. This is a fantastic question and relevant to many of us, even if we don't have scoliosis. Because asymmetrically tight muscles can cause a curvature and rotation of the spine for almost all of us. And awareness is the key to working with this issue. You see, we just don't use our body symmetrically. So many of us are walking around with a greater degree of muscle tension on one side from the other. Whether you have scoliosis or not, it's important to learn to listen to your body and uncover and address 
these imbalances and asymmetries. So where do you begin? Always at the bottom. Start working on foot mobility, calf and hamstring stretching, psoas releasing, pelvic and rib alignment. When the feet are pointed straight ahead and the kneecaps are down and the pelvis and ribs are in neutral, and it can take some time to get comfortable with those alignment points themselves, but only then are we in a position to uncover the tension patterns in our chest and shoulders that are affecting the alignment of our spine. It's highly likely that one of your pecs is extremely tight if you have scoliosis. Uncovering which one and working to reduce that tension is the next step. But baby steps. Start with the feet, always with the feet. Whole body alignment is always the answer. We can't just look at our parts in isolation. Okay, I hope you find that helpful. And for everyone else, I absolutely love answering your questions. If you have a question you'd like me to answer in a future episode, you can call me at 201-580-MOVE, or you can just click the leave me a message link in the show notes at healthymovingpodcast.com. As a way of saying thanks, if I use your question on a future episode, I'll send you a little something in the mail just to say thanks. I would love your feedback on the show. Would you head to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review? I would so appreciate it. And if you're enjoying the show, I'd really appreciate you helping me spread the word. Head over to HealthyMovingPodcast.com. There's links there to make sharing it very easy. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, friends, keep moving.